True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Tiso Blackstar Group, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live, and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Tiso Blackstar Group or its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht. And you're listening to episode 18, The Mordi Morley Monster. I feel like this case has been requested by a ton of listeners, but I could only find three names, so I really hope I haven't missed anyone. This case was suggested on Facebook by Jean Azel and Kim Stratton Kaywood, and on Twitter by user Rusty Braces, which I strongly believe is not his or her real name. But if it is, that's a very cool name. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to give shout-outs to our new Patreon members. Last month, I announced that True Crime South Africa now has its own Patreon page to help support the show, expand our research capabilities, and buy new equipment. And did you guys ever come to the party? Holy moly. Thank you to Toast, Marie, Adriana Coit king Nanette, Tanya Beneka, Jen Carew, Janine Stein, Megan Ranker, Megan Repko, Rosalie Smith, Mathlatse Chawane, and Angie. You guys are all freaking superstars. Support for the show on Patreon starts at one US dollar a month, which is about 15 rand, and you can cancel at any time. I'll leave the Patreon link in the show notes, or you can go to the Patreon website and search for True Crime South Africa. Every single contribution makes a huge difference, and when we reach 200 Patreon supporters, I'll start releasing monthly Patreon-exclusive episodes. No matter how you support the show, though, your contribution always matters, whether it's through Patreon or being a listener, sharing our episodes, or telling others about True Crime South Africa. Every single bit helps, and I really appreciate your support. Now that we've got that covered, let's get into today's episode. This case deals with extreme sexual and physical violence towards women, and if you feel that you may be triggered by that sort of content, I really don't mind if you skip this episode. I'll give you a warning again before I get into the details of what occurred, so you could also just skip through that section. This case is probably one of the most sadistic cases of domestic violence that this country has ever seen. And if the violence wrought upon the direct victim and her son was not bad enough, when people started to dig, there were many, many skeletons to be found in the past of this perpetrator. When you look at this case in hindsight with all the information, It's almost like this man's life was an avalanche of selfishness, violence and hatred that built up as it cascaded down through time and landed with full force on the Binet family. To research this case, I relied heavily on the book Love is War by Karen Morn. Karen is a journalist for EWN and she covered this case from beginning to end. The book is detailed and well written and I highly recommend it. Without further ado, let's get into episode 18, The Mori Moli Monster. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault, or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, Please see the helpline information on our show notes. Just after 5pm on the 3rd of January 2012, Warrant Officer Hendrik Kruger walked into a house in Mori Moli, formerly Nailstrom. On a table in the front hall, he found a 22 calibre gun. Near the gun was a photograph of a smiling Johan Kortzer and his bride, Ina Bunei taken on their wedding day. Across the photograph, Johan Kotzer had scrawled the words, Love is like war. Easy to start. Difficult to end. Impossible to forget. 
what Warrant Officer Kruger found in that house would be impossible to forget. On the upper level of the house, a devastated mother, having been assaulted, tortured and beaten, cradled the body of her 19-year-old son. Johann Kotzer was nowhere to be found, and a manhunt began for Inna's husband. Johannes Christian Kotzer was born in Namibia in 1961 to unwed parents. His mother abandoned him at birth, and he was adopted by a neighbour who sadly passed away when Johann was just three months old. When his adopted mother passed away, Johann's biological father took back custody and soon married a woman who would become Johann's stepmother. Johann's father and stepmother had two daughters together, and although they were essentially Johann's stepsisters, the bond between the siblings was strong, and they were constantly supportive of Johann throughout his life. Johann's stepsisters would later say that he had a very poor self-image as a child. Being born outside of wedlock was, of course, still a major stigma in the 1960s, and Johann was allegedly bullied and called some derogatory terms. In 1969, 1,100 kilometers from Johann's home in Namibia, in Rustenburg, South Africa, a baby girl was born, whose life path would intersect with Johann's almost five decades later, with catastrophic results. Lavina Swanepoel, who would call herself Ina, was born into a farming community, and despite her rural lifestyle and growing up with two brothers, Ina says that her greatest dream was to become a secretary in the city and wear high heels. And she did, and she hated it. Ina lasted just a few months working in Johannesburg at the Department of Home Affairs, before realising it wasn't for her, and moving back to the farm. When she was 21, Ina met and married Rex Bonnet. They welcomed their son, Conrad, and daughter, Angelique, within the next few years. In 2004, Angelique discovered that Rex was being unfaithful and informed her mother. Ina and Rex divorced in 2005, and the children lived predominantly with Ina, but still had a strong bond with their father. Ina had become an extremely successful businesswoman in the insurance industry and ran her own portfolio. Ina Bonet is a strikingly beautiful woman. She has a strength that radiates from within her, even if you didn't know what she's been through. She just strikes me as always having been one of those women who inspire and lead. Perhaps it's these very qualities which would make her later experiences with Johann Kotze seem even more bizarre. Ina Bonet's first interaction with Johann Kotze was on the telephone in August 2009. They chatted for a few weeks before arranging to meet for the first time. Ina didn't jump into a meeting with Johann, first spending quite some time getting to know him on the phone. She arranged their first meeting place at an engine garage, presumably to get a feel for him face-to-face, before she took him to her house to visit. Johan still lived in Blymfontein at this time, so the trip to Morimole was almost six hours. After that first visit, Johan would drive the 600 kilometres each way, every weekend, to visit Ina. He was charming and seemed successful. He treated Ina well and spoiled her with expensive gifts and trips. Ina was overwhelmed by this wonderful man who was so committed to her. Her friends liked him too. He was always a gentleman. The manipulation and control techniques started very slowly, almost imperceptibly. Johan commented that Ina's hair looked unkempt as long as it was, and he wanted her to cut it. Ina was happy with her long hair, but after continuous comments from her new man, she agreed to cut it. Ina said that Johan had been obsessed with her breasts. 
She had undergone breast augmentation during her first marriage, as her breasts had been severely impacted by breastfeeding her children. When Johan was not with Ina, he demanded nude photos continuously. Ina didn't feel comfortable doing this and turned him down, saying that his phone could get stolen and her photos could end up in the wrong hands. Johan was insistent, though, and eventually Ina relented and sent him one photograph. In turn, he bombarded her with unsolicited nude photographs of himself. Johan made sure that he knew everyone in Ina's life, including her co-workers. And when he decided that it was time to propose, he even roped in her co-workers to pretend that there was a function she needed to attend in order to get her where he wanted her. Ina doesn't say whether she was actually ready for marriage at this stage, but regardless, eight months after meeting Johann Kortza, she became engaged to him. The wedding was planned for the 23rd of October 2010, but when the wonderful day arrived, their plans were rained out, and the couple had to have the service in the same hall as the reception. Perhaps the weather should have been a sign of foreboding for Inna, but if it wasn't, her wedding night would be. When they arrived in their overnight accommodation, Johan told Inna to sit down on the bed, and he told her that their marriage would be a great success if she just obeyed the rules that he was about to lay down. Inna was told that she would no longer see anyone without his permission. Her parents had to make an appointment if they wanted to visit, and she had to get his permission to see them. Her children would no longer answer to her, Jan said. If they wanted to do something, they would ask his permission. Next up in the rule book was Inna's appearance. She'd already cut her hair for him, but this wasn't enough. He wanted Inna to put on some weight, as he thought she looked sickly. Her clothing would also be chosen by him, and she needed to start wearing lower-cut shirts to show off her cleavage, and also dark jeans, because that's just what he preferred. She needed to map out her work days for him, to the last detail. He wanted to know where she was at every moment. Inna recalls being completely shocked by this 180-degree turn. The newlyweds moved in together, and Johan promptly sold every single item of furniture that Inna owned, as well as all of her appliances. He explained that it would be better if they had furniture and appliances that they chose together, and he promised Inna that anything he purchased would be as much hers as it was his. The independent woman, who had done very well to survive on her own for five years after her divorce, and built up a household of her own possessions, suddenly didn't have a single item to her name. Inna recalls that while she had to share every detail of her life with Johan, he told her very little about his movements. She became uneasy when he constantly had his cell phone with him, and would always take phone calls out of earshot. Inna struggled within the relationship, She constantly felt that Johan was not being honest with her, and one night when he was away on business, his dishonesty went to a new level. He called Inna and told her that his new life insurance had been declined because he had leukemia. Inna was understandably stunned and already having suspicions about her new husband's honesty. She did a bit of investigation and uncovered that Johan did not have leukemia. I have no idea why someone would lie about this, but I think that Johan was either realizing he was losing control of Ina, or he wanted to milk her for money. Either way, this was the last straw for Ina, and she told him that she could not take such a level of dishonesty, and she moved out. It was March 2011. They'd been married for five months. Jan spent the next five months trying to convince Inna to give their marriage a second chance. He made unending promises, until eventually in June 2011, 
in a cave den, and she and her daughter, Angelique, moved back in with Johan. When Ina was moving her belongings back into the bedroom, she found a box in the bottom of his cupboard. It contained five cell phones. Every cell phone had messages on it from different women, and numerous nude photographs. When confronted, Johan said that he was keeping the phones as evidence because he'd laid charges of sexual harassment against the woman. Ina doesn't say much more about this incident, but it seems that she decided to let it slide because she continued to move in. To celebrate the reunion, in July 2011, Johan sent Ina and her daughter on a weekend away to visit her parents. When she returned, the house was completely bare. Johan was there, but he'd sold every single item of furniture in the house, as well as the appliances. Ina was obviously not happy, and demanded to know what was going on. She instructed Angelique to go to her room and lock the door. Johan didn't like this, and he started trying to break down Angelique's bedroom door. Furious that this man was terrorising her daughter and had sold all of their possessions, Ina snapped and slapped Johan's face. She and Angelique took the clothes and small items they still owned, loaded them in her car, and stayed in the dormitory of a local boarding school overnight. Ina was finished with Johan Kotzer. She could no longer take his lies and manipulative behaviour. He was also becoming increasingly violent, and his behaviour that night had scared Ina. She wasn't sure what he would have done if he'd gotten to her daughter. Johann Kotzer went to the police station the next day and requested a protection order against Ina, citing her assault of him the previous night. Ina was quite happy to comply because she had no interest in seeing Johann again. Ina and her children moved into a flat in a complex in Morimole. They had absolutely no furniture, but she says that at that point she didn't care. She was so happy to be away from Johan that she would have sat on the floor forever if she had to. Ina's son, Conrad, split his time between his father and mother and was elated that Ina had ended the poisonous relationship. He wanted his mom to be happy. But he'd never liked Johan Kotzer, and he'd never felt comfortable around him. Johan's heavy-handed approach to parenting his stepchildren didn't sit well with Conrad either. Johan may have taken out a protection order against Ina, but he had no problem contravening it himself. He found out where Ina was living, and would arrive at her flat without invitation. He followed her almost everywhere she went, and in the period between July 2011 and January 2012, he phoned Ina 154 times and texted her 184 times. Ina's parents had also never been too keen on Johan Kortza, and during this period, Johan and Ina's father got into a physical altercation. Johan beat Ina's elderly father up so badly that he required urgent medical attention. Then he drove to the police station and laid a charge of assault against her father. Johan allegedly bribed witnesses to say that he had been the victim and that Ina's father had attacked him and he'd just been defending himself. In November 2011, Johan arrived at Ina's home unannounced. He told her that he was going to be renting a house from his friend Dirk van der Merwe and that after he was finished with it, it was going to be the most talked about house in Morimole. Little did Ina know what that statement would really mean. Dirk van der Merwe and his wife Vivian had been very good friends with Johan for many years. Van der Merwe recalled Johan calling him one day and asking him if his house in Morimole was up for rent. Having long-term tenants in the house, Van Amerva told Johan that he was sorry, but the house was occupied. Miraculously, 
24 hours after Johan Kotze made this request, Van der Merwe's long-term tenants very suddenly gave their notice. It's never been proven whether Johan actually had an involvement in this sudden turn of events, but I think it's highly likely that he threatened the tenants because he wanted the house. And what Johan Kotze wanted, Johan Kotze got. As Christmas 2011 rolled around, Johan tried to get Inna to feel sorry for him and spend time with him on Christmas Day. She already had plans with her children and her son Conrad had invited one of his friends, and that boy's father. Conrad and the boy had been friends for many years, and the boy's father had been a family friend when Inna was still married to Rex. The group spent Christmas Day at a party at a resort, and then drove back to the man's house, which was closer than Inna's flat. Inna was no longer with Johan at this time, and she'd made her intentions clear that she didn't want to reconcile with him. If she'd been involved in any other relationships at this time, that would have been her choice. But she wasn't. Despite what Johan would later claim, Inna insists that she had absolutely no physical contact with the father of her son's friend that night. And in my opinion, considering the context that this statement would occur within, there's absolutely no reason for her to have lied. Jan would claim that he'd followed Ina that night. First, he'd seen her at the resort, where he claimed he'd seen her hugging the man. Later, he followed her to the man's house, and said he saw him fondling Ina's breasts. It was this sight, he claimed, that started his mental degeneration, and resulted in what happened next. Inna had been pushing Johan to finalise their divorce arrangements, so when he contacted her on the 3rd of January 2012 to say that he wanted to have a discussion with her, she readily agreed, hoping that she might be able to start the new year by finalising her divorce from Johan. He'd wanted her to come to his house at 10 o'clock in the morning, but she couldn't make it as she had a few things she had to do at the office. She said half past two in the afternoon would be better, and he agreed. After speaking with Inna, Johan left his house and collected three men from a petrol station. He'd prearranged for one of the men, Andri Satoli, to arrange two others for the plans he had for the day. Johan collected Andri Satoli, Peter Mochlake, and Selo Mpaka from the petrol station where a taxi driver was waiting with them. He paid the driver his fare for having transported the men from Hammanskral, and all three got into Johan's bucky. He then took the men to a supermarket near his home, where he allowed them to purchase cooked food and bought cigarettes for Satoli. After eating their food under a nearby tree, the men all piled into Johan's bucky, but there was one more stop to make before they headed to Johan's house. They stopped at a pep store, and although later accounts of who purchased the items would differ, we do know that the bucky pulled away from the pep store with three packets of pantyhose inside. They arrived at Johan's house and were given some manual labour to do, replanting palm trees which they started to attend to. What I'm going to give you here is Ina Bonet's account of what happened that afternoon. When we get to discussing the trial proceedings, I'll clarify how the accounts differ depending on which of the other men was telling the story. Inna arrived at Johan's home around 2.30. She said that he seemed relaxed and jovial. He showed her to an outside table where they sat and spoke for a while. Inna said that she didn't really feel like the conversation was going anywhere and they weren't achieving anything in terms of settling their differences where the separation was concerned. She started to become annoyed and wanted to leave. Johan stopped her and told her that before she left, she should fetch a box of her belongings in his bedroom. 
Ina was confused because she'd never lived in that house with Jan, so she had no idea what belongings he could be referring to. Wanting to get the encounter over with, though, she walked in the direction that Johan had instructed her to, and entered the main bedroom of the house. From this point, I'm going to be getting into the graphic details of the sexual assaults and torture of Ina Bonnet. I considered whether it was necessary to share this, but Ina was brave enough to stand up and tell the world about what Johan Kotze did to her, so I will honour that courage too. If you need to skip ahead a bit, about five minutes to do it. Ina says that when she entered the bedroom, there was a towel laying on the bed which had a pile of loose change on it. Jan picked up the towel and the coins clattered onto the hardwood floor, making a huge noise. She believes that this was the sign that Johan had arranged for his accomplices. He threw the towel over Ina's head and pushed her onto the bed. When the towel came off her head, she saw that three men wearing pantyhose over their heads had entered the room and stood around her. Satole, Mpaka, and Mokhlake. Johan gave instructions to the men in Afrikaans, and Satole translated for the other two. Ina's hands were tied behind her head, and her mouth was gagged with masking tape. These actions were undertaken by all four men. Satole had tried to gag her with a single piece of masking tape, but when he couldn't break the tape, he became frustrated and just wrapped the tape continuously around her face until her mouth was covered and part of her nose was too. She had a tiny gap to breathe through. During this time, Johan was giving instructions as to what the men should do. Hold her legs down. Tie her up. Then he started to tell Ina that she was about to be gang-raped, and she should prepare herself. Ina says that Johan started to make remarks about her having cheated on him, and this was what she got for cheating on him. Ina had no idea what he was talking about, but couldn't speak, so she shook her head violently to deny the claims. During the sustained attack, Johan would constantly tell her, when I leave a woman, she either kills herself, or she ends up in a mental institution. She would later find out that this had been something he told people throughout the years as he bragged about his conquests. She would also find out why he said that. When Johan mentioned gang rape, Ina's mind also flashed back to a conversation they'd had when they just started seeing each other. Johan had asked her what her greatest fear was, and Ina had replied that being gang raped was her greatest fear. Ina saw that Kotza had a gun in his waistband, and he would occasionally pull it out and point it at her, most likely just to see the fear in her eyes. The weapon he picked up next, though, was far more terrifying. He instructed the men to undress Ina, pulling down her pants and tearing open her shirt to reveal her breasts. And then Kotze picked up a pair of pliers. He twisted Ina's left nipple with the pliers and ripped it off. He then inserted a nail into the flesh of her right breast and squeezed it until blood erupted through the skin. He grabbed a pair of scissors and cut off chunks of her hair. He then pushed the pliers into her anus and inserted a metal object that Ina couldn't identify of about 25 centimetres into her vagina. He threw a bucket of ice-cold water over her and nodded to the waiting men to begin the rape. Setole raped Ina first, then Mokhlake, and then Mpaka. Ina said that Mpaka had initially been unable to reach an erection, but he'd eventually managed to rape her as well. While this was happening, Johan Kotze phoned his teenage daughter from a previous relationship and chatted to her about a trip that she was making to see him. When the rape was over, 
he told the men to leave the room and wait for him. In one last act of torture, he poured a mixture called Staldrippels, which is ferric chloride, onto her mutilated breasts and badly damaged genitals. The compound is used to stop bleeding in livestock and elicits a serious sting in just one or two drops, which is supposed to be the dosage. Johan poured almost the entire bottle onto Inna's battered body. He then took Inna's phone from her handbag and told her that he was going to lure her 19-year-old son Conrad to the house and he was going to force him to have sex with her and if he refused, he was going to kill him. Conrad would never have answered if he'd known it was Johan calling but since he'd phoned from his mother's phone, he answered immediately. Johan told Conrad that his mother was at his house and that he should come past because they wanted to speak to him. No one will ever know what went through Conrad's head in those minutes that it took for him to get to the house. He was at gym when he received the call, but knowing as well as he did that his mother would not willingly be calling him to Johan's house, he probably realised that something was very wrong. He took a friend with him to the house that day. This was most likely because he felt threatened. Ina Bonet lay bound and gagged, helpless, as her son made his way to Johann Kortz's house, completely unaware that he was walking into an ambush. Ina and Johann heard Conrad's motorbike enter the property at the same time. Johann gave Ina one last look and then left the room. Conrad's friend would later testify that Johann Kortzer had looked absolutely fine when he met them on the driveway that day. He said he needed help moving a few things, and asked Conrad's friend to get a crate out of the garage. The young man heard Johann say to Conrad as he walked away that his mother was in the house if he wanted to see her. Just moments later, Ina would hear her son's voice saying, No, uncle, please don't, three times, before hearing three consecutive gunshots, and then silence. Johan did not come back into the room. It's unknown whether Kortz's accomplices fled the premises before or after the gunshots, but they too were gone by the time Conrad's friend re-entered the house. He stayed on the lower level. He had a feeling that there were some family issues happening and he didn't want to pry, so he decided to stay downstairs until someone called him. He had no idea that Johann Kotzer had just gotten into his bucky and fled the premises. He also had not heard the gunshots. As Johann fled the house, he phoned his friend Dirk van Amava. He didn't answer, so he phoned Dirk's wife, Vivian. He told Vivian that there'd been a problem at the house, and someone should go look. Having no idea what she was walking into, Vivian van der Merwe walked into the house and found Conrad's friend still waiting downstairs. Conrad's body was laying in the hallway leading to the main bedroom. He was already dead. Ina Bonet was cut loose and ran to her son. She cradled his body until she was guided away later when Warren's officer Kruger arrived. Ina could not face going to a hospital to be examined, so she opted to be examined by a general practitioner. Unfortunately, the GP had never done a sexual assault assessment before and although he noted the bulk of Vina's injuries, there were many that he failed to record. He did confirm that Inna had been sexually assaulted and forcibly penetrated. The nightmare would continue for a week, as Inna and her family had no idea whether they were safe, with Johann Kortza on the run. Inna's statement to police indicated that there had been three accomplices, By checking Johan's phone records, they realised that he'd been in contact with one person besides Ina 
Fandameva and his daughter that day. Andres Satole. Not only had he phoned Satole early that morning, but Kortza had phoned the man 41 times in the last two weeks. Andres Satole was arrested fairly quickly and gave up the names of the two other men. He would later claim that he was tortured by police. At the time of these arrests, a narrative emerged in the media and in the community that the three men had been forced to rape Inna by Johan Kotza. Sufficient evidence would be led in court to prove the opposite, though. Interestingly, Mpaka and Mokhlake did visit the police station in the time before they were arrested. They weren't there to hand themselves over, though, or complain that they'd been forced to rape a woman. They were there to lay a charge against Kotza for not having paid them for their day's work. The police told the men that they'd have to open a case at the small claims court, and they did so the next day. A huge manhunt was launched for Johan Kotza. An SMS campaign was undertaken, where his photograph was distributed to every cell phone in a specific radius. At one stage, police believed that he might have fled back to Namibia. Eight days after his gruesome crime, though, Kotze was spotted at a petrol station in Morimole. The woman who saw him called the police, and they just missed him. Johan realised that he'd been spotted, though, and in his rush to get away, he crashed his vehicle into a tree. Now on foot, Kotze knew that he had very little chance of evading police. A few hours later, he walked into the dental practice of his friend, Dirk van der Merwe. Dirk was horrified to see Johan standing in his office, but realised that he needed to keep him there. Johan said that he just wanted to talk to Dirk and get some advice. Dirk agreed and said he was going to make some coffee and they could chat. He slipped out of the room and phoned police. Johan Kotze was taken into custody within 10 minutes of that phone call. A hideout was discovered in the bushes where Johan had been staying. His vehicle, as well as his hideouts, contained blankets, a gas stove to cook food on, food and stacks of letters. Johan had been writing letters, predominantly addressed to Ina, throughout his time on the run. He would later claim that he tried to commit suicide by putting the blanket over the gas stove and inhaling the fumes. In most of the letters, he blamed Ina for his actions, continuing to claim that she cheated on him and driven him to madness. The letters were largely unintelligible, but all around one theme. Ina was the problem, and he just reacted. Johan had a few superficial wounds, and was quite worse for wear from having lived in the bush for a week. The police needed to get him seen by a doctor, but unfortunately none of the local doctors wanted to see him. His injuries weren't life-threatening, so that was their choice. Police eventually managed to find one GP who agreed to assess Johan. He treated his scrapes and scratches, and noted from a mental perspective Johan seemed absolutely fine. He wasn't displaying any signs of depression, and wasn't confused or disorientated. Johan Kotza and his three accomplices were all charged with one count of murder for Conrad, one count of attempted murder for Ina, kidnapping and rape. On the same day of Johan's first appearance in court, Conrad Bernay was laid to rest by his grieving family. In eulogies, those who knew him best described him as deeply religious and someone who always wanted to do the right thing. His friends joked that, hard as they tried, they couldn't get Conrad to do anything naughty with them. Sadly, it also emerged at his funeral that Conrad had been afraid of Jan Kotza. He had told a friend in a half-joking manner that if he ever disappeared, they should know that Johan was behind it. Having declined to apply for bail, Johan Kotzer was behind bars. 
but the rumour mill started to swirl, and if Ina thought that she knew the absolute worst about her husband, she was about to be proven wrong. Johan could no longer hide his past, and soon the whole sordid history was on display. Ina and Conrad Bonai were not his first victims. When Johan, as a young man, left Namibia, he moved to Priska in the Northern Cape. He soon built up a reputation as a troublemaker. Any business deal he was involved in ended in a dispute. Somehow, when the previous sheriff of the court for Priska retired in 1994, Johan snagged the job. The sheriff of the court in Priska was responsible for carrying out the seizure of reclaimed property and tracking down people who defaulted on debt. The people of Priska would remember Johann Kotz's time in office as very strange. He was unduly aggressive in carrying out his duties. He seemed to revel in embarrassing people and would use physical violence as often as possible. On one occasion, he was tasked with finding a young man who was alleged to have unpaid debt. He entered the yard of the man and drew his firearm. A chase ensued and the young man heard gunshots. He turned around to find his elderly mother laying dead from a gunshot wound on their front porch. The woman had seen Johan running through her yard with a gun and screamed. Witnesses claimed that Johan had turned and fired one shot directly at the woman. He claimed it was an accident. He was charged with murder, but his trial only lasted one day. He was acquitted on the basis of insufficient testimony. According to friends and family, Johan told this story many times over the years, never with a hint of remorse. He told it as though it were just another interesting story to tell around the bra. He always claimed it was an accident, but never seemed at all put out by the fact that he had taken a laugh. On the contrary, the story of Bet Boerter's murder would then be accompanied with tales of how he'd tortured other people he'd apprehended during his time as sheriff. He'd cut off a man's ear, he claimed, and pulled out people's pubic hair with pliers. So Inna now knew that Conrad had not been Johann's first murder victim, but there were more stories to be told. Johann had not been joking when he said when he left a woman she either ended up committing suicide or in a mental institution. The only woman who would not go into detail about the abuse she suffered at the hands of Johann Kotze would be his first wife, the mother of his teenage daughter. I am purposely not mentioning her name or the name of his daughter because I don't believe that they deserve to have any further acknowledgements of their connection to Johan Kotze. The story of Sarita Fenta did come to light though. Sarita had met Johan on a dating app in 2008. She'd been a hugely successful businesswoman with four children. She was smart and strong, but when Johan met her, she was extremely ill. Sarita had been diagnosed with a brain tumour a few months before, and she was fighting to survive. She had to have a constant supply of oxygen. Johan and Sarita quickly became an item, and he didn't wait to start exerting his control over her. Her children would later say that he'd broken Sarita down with constant demeaning. He insulted her physical appearance constantly. He insulted her physical appearance, predominantly focusing on insulting her breasts and her hair. He refused to have a physical relationship with her because he claimed he suffered from sexual dysfunction, which was later proven to be a lie because he was having a physical relationship with other women at the time that he was with Sarita. He told Sarita that he would help her to invest her money but he could never account for what he did with it. And by the time he was finished with her, 
he owed her an estimated one million rand. Johan accompanied Sarita on a holiday to Mozambique. Sarita's oxygen pipe was a constant feature, and it ran across the bottom of her nose. He called her Snafy because of this. Sarita's medical aid paid for the expensive treatment, because she'd proven that she needed it to live. While they were on holiday, Johan convinced Sarita to remove the oxygen pipe momentarily and take a photograph seated on a four-wheeler. When they returned from that holiday, he told her that he needed money, and if she didn't give him what he wanted, he was going to send the photograph of her without her oxygen to the medical aid. Sarita refused, and Johan did not hesitate to carry out his threat. The medical aid cancelled Sarita's coverage, and she was forced to pay back the money they'd already spent on her condition. Also, while on this holiday, Johan asked a friend of one of Sarita's sons for telephone numbers of rich widows or divorcees, claiming that he wanted to help these women with their finances. Among the names and telephone numbers he received was that of Ina Bonet. This was how Johan had found Ina. He started seeing her while Sarita still thought she was in a relationship with him. When Sarita found out that Johan was already with another woman, she phoned Ina to warn her. Unfortunately, Johan convinced Ina that Sarita was just a bitter ex-girlfriend. About a month after Johan Kotzer had started seeing Ina, Sarita Fenta took her own life. She was emotionally broken, financially ruined, and saw no hope for the future. One of her sons still believes to this day that his mother did not take her own life, but that she was, in fact, murdered by Johan Kotzer. There was another woman that Johan was seeing while he was with Sarita. Her surname was withheld, and in the book she's named as Marita. Marita had initially believed that she was in a serious relationship with Johan. She quickly became the victim of his control, manipulation, and degradation. He told her to cut her hair. She did. He was obsessed with her breasts as well constantly commenting on their shape and size. He wanted to invest her money for her, and suggested that she let him sell her house and split the profit with him. He was enraged when she sold the house on her own and refused to give him any money. Marita eventually broke up with Johan, but he was not finished with her. He would eventually, through much stalking, pressure and terror tactics, get 50,000 rand out of her. When she was finally free of him, she'd contacted Sarita, and the woman had conversations about how they could get their money back from Johan. Marita had phoned Ina too. Again, Johan was able to convince her that this was just another ex-girlfriend driven mad because he'd ended his relationship with her. There were five other women from Bloemfontein who were putting together a case against Johan. He had managed to get a total of 1.3 million rand from them. I did a search on the Safley website to see what other cases I could find against Johan Kortzer, and I found something very interesting. Johan had always claimed that he'd lost his farm in Bloemfontein because of a woman that he was in a relationship with. I'm sure this is not going to surprise you, but that was not entirely true. Johan had been leasing farmland in Bloemfontein, as well as the livestock that was on the land. He didn't own it. In 2011, when he was most likely telling Ina that he was going to Bloemfontein on business, he was actually attending a court case. He'd been sued by the owners of the land and the livestock, because the livestock had disappeared, and they wanted financial compensation. They won the case, and in June 2011, Johan was ordered to pay 500,000 rand to the owners of the livestock, as well as their legal costs. 
You may remember that something else happened in June and July of 2011. Ina came home to an empty house because Johanna claimed to have sold all of their furniture and appliances. Now that we know that he had this judgment against him, the question is, did he really sell it all? Or was it all taken to pay his debt? Johan was no stranger to the court system by that time either. I found another judgment in 2004, where he had to return a bucky because he'd purchased it from a man and failed to pay for it. A sex worker came out of the woodwork when Johan's face was splashed all over the newspapers to say that he'd been her client for most of his marriage with Ina. She had proof as well. The woman said that Johan would constantly complain to her that his wife wasn't honest with him. The woman pointed out that Johan was cheating on his wife with her, so how could he be angry about honesty? He became enraged with the woman and told her it was not the same thing. Johan Kortz's dark history was no longer a secret. He'd spent his entire life destroying women for financial gain, and now he had completely destroyed the life of Ina Bonet. I wondered for a while about why Johan didn't kill Ina. I think that he purposely left her alive. Not because he didn't have it in him to kill her, but because he wanted her to suffer. He wanted her to live with the fact that she'd been gang raped and that her son had been murdered. He most likely thought that she'd end up like many of the other women he'd destroyed, committing suicide or in an institution. He highly underestimated Ina Bonet. Ina was given the opportunity to have her identity withheld during the trial, as all victims of sexual assault are. She refused. She was going to get justice for her son, and if that meant she had to stand up in front of the entire country and tell everyone the intimate and harrowing details of how she was violated, then she was prepared to do that. Johann Kotzer started off the court proceedings just as he'd lived his life, attempting to control and manipulate everything. He refused to enter a plea to the charges against him. Eventually the judge would enter a not guilty plea on his behalf, just so that they could proceed. Johan then demanded a psychiatric assessment, as he decided that his defence was going to be temporary insanity. He was afforded the assessment and was found fit to stand trial. The trial started with four days of harrowing testimony by Ina. The details of her testimony were so graphic and disturbing that the judge banned journalists from tweeting about it. The judge would later say that Ina was one of the best witnesses he had ever seen in a trial. She never looked at Johan, speaking directly to the judge. Her testimony was clear, chronological and concise. Only once, as she detailed how she heard her son pleading for his life, did she break down to such an extent that proceedings had to be postponed. Then the cross-examination started, and it became clear what the defence was going to be. Ina was called a liar, because she'd said additional things on the stand that were not in her original statement. The injuries she suffered were also brought into question, because the doctor hadn't listed all of them. Johan started with a defence lawyer by the name of Bankies. The man led Ina in questioning, which insinuated that she cheated on Johan on multiple occasions, and essentially driven him to madness. Johan also instructed his defence counsel to put it to Ina that she was not actually raped, because there was no DNA found inside of her. The judge would later state that there could be many reasons why DNA was not present, including the stall ripples that Johan had poured onto and into her vagina and over her breasts. The line of questioning started a completely different narrative to the case. Ina was painted as a loose woman, 
who had cheated on Johan so many different times and lied to him so much that his actions were simply a result of her own abuse of him. Insanely, Johan Kotze started to build quite a pool of support. Inna started getting threatening phone calls and messages. An attorney, completely unrelated to the case, was actually fired because he stated on social media that what happened to Inna was a lesson to all women, that they couldn't just treat men however they wanted and get away with it. Many people were under the impression, created by Johan of course, that he'd paid for Inna's breast surgery. And this man even went so far as to say that he felt Johan was in his full rights to damage the breasts he had paid for. Facebook groups were formed against Inna and in support of Johan. About halfway through the trial, Johan's defence counsel spoke to the media and said that Johan was very popular with the ladies and he was getting piles of fan mail in jail. Inna held her head up high and continued with proceedings. She could only hope that Johan would be found guilty so that the stories about her could be laid to rest. The sensation around Johann Kotze was so intense that his three accomplices were almost forgotten about. In fact, so little attention had been paid to the men that toward the end of the two-year trial, it emerged that the court had been calling Peter Mochlake by the wrong name the whole time. For two years, he'd been referred to as Peter Mochlane, the three accomplices all still insisted that they were forced to rape Inna Bonnet at gunpoint. Essentially, their story was that they had been brought to the house under the auspices of doing renovation work, and then they'd been locked in the bedroom cupboard while Inna entered the room. Anything they did after that was under duress of violence from Johann Kotza, they claimed. In fact, they all said that none of them had actually raped Ina at all. They'd all just pretended to rape her, but actually never penetrated her. Sitole presented himself as being as much a victim as the other two, but when the men testified, that all went out the window. Mokhlake and Mpaka said that it had become very clear to them that Kotsa and Sitole knew each other well and that they were working together. They told the court that when Kotza had ushered them out of the bedroom, they'd asked Satole what was going to happen now, and Satole said that they were waiting for Inna's son, because Johan wanted to hurt him too. In the beginning of the trial, Andres Satole had constantly attempted to cover his face, and the reason for this would soon emerge. It's alleged that when taken into police custody, Satole found out for the first time that he was HIV positive. This meant that his wife and children had to be tested too. His wife was unfortunately also HIV positive, but the status of his children was never revealed. Satole had allegedly been trying to protect his identity because he didn't want the HIV status linked with his name. The state, however, did not believe that Sotole was just finding out for the first time that he was HIV positive. In fact, the attempted murder charges with regards to Ina stemmed from the fact that the state believed that both Sotole and Johan had known that Sotole was HIV positive, and they planned to infect Ina through the rape. The 41 phone calls between Satole and Kotza was proof, the state said, that the attack had been planned and that Satole was well aware of what he was being hired to do. Satole denied this, saying that they had only ever spoken on the phone about renovations that Johan wanted to do. When asked, though, he couldn't detail what the renovations were that they had discussed. Satole was very well spoken and prosecutors would later say that they believed him to be far more intelligent than Johann Kotza. Johann's testimony would be a looping, blabbering mess. 
Johan seemed to be trying to hold on to his temporary insanity defense so tightly that he even behaved temporarily insane on the stand. The crux of his testimony about the attacks was that he'd had nothing to do with the rape. He claimed that the three men had snuck into his house without his knowledge and attacked Inna, and he'd actually been the one to save her. When he said this, his accomplice's eyes grew wide, and Paka actually put his hand over his mouth in shock. Johan alleged that after he convinced the three men to leave the house, he'd laid down next to Inna, and for the next few hours he moved in and out of consciousness. He said that on the occasions that he'd regained consciousness, he realized that he must have hurt Inna because he saw that her breasts were mutilated. He said that he'd done this because he'd been so angry at her for cheating on him. Young claimed that for the months preceding the attack, he'd been declining mentally and in a terrible state because of Inna's alleged infidelity. He actually turned the entire thing around and claimed that Inna had desperately wanted to get back together with him, but he wanted to take things slowly because he didn't trust her anymore. He denied that Inna had discussed divorce and said that when he'd invited her to the house that day, it had been to discuss their reconciliation. But then Inna had gotten nasty and thrown a vibrator at him and he became enraged with her. I swear, if this man wasn't such a vile excuse for a human being, his nonsense would actually be laughable. Johan could not explain why he hadn't untied Inna if he was her rescuer, nor why he hadn't used the weapon to hold the men at gunpoint and called police. He claimed that Inna had told him to phone Con- he claimed that Inna had told him to phone Conrad because she wanted him to come there and that somehow, with her hands bound behind her head, she dialed his number. But Johan had to speak because Inna was still gagged. Why he didn't just remove the gag was another thing he couldn't explain. As for how Conrad received three gunshots, Johan said he had no idea. He admitted having the gun in his hand and then hearing one gunshot and seeing Conrad fall to his knees but that was all he remembered. He claims that he only realised Conrad was dead when he heard it on the radio. He spent most of his rambling testimony complaining about what a bad wife Ina was and how she'd never cooked for him and how she told him that she stopped smoking but she hadn't. Toward the end of the trial, Johan changed lawyers. He claimed that Bankis had been poorly representing him but it emerged that he'd actually stopped paying the man, so he'd withdrawn his services. Johan's new lawyer, Piet Kreilung, was a name that I found on the livestock theft cases as well. Kreilung had represented Johan before. Johan would use this change in counsel to counter some inconsistencies in his testimony, claiming that Bankies had made his own decisions about what to say in court. Johan claimed that he'd never actually met Satole before the 3rd of January, and all the phone calls he'd made to him were only about the renovations. He couldn't explain how he managed to invest so much time in planning such detailed renovations while he was as severely distraught as he claimed to be over Inna's alleged infidelity. With Kreilung now running the defence, a psychologist was called to testify for Johan. I'm not going to mention this woman's name, because, as far as I can tell, she no longer has any dealings with Kotsa, and I wouldn't want to cause her any further embarrassment. She's a highly qualified practicing psychologist, though. She testified that she found that Johan Kotsa suffered from narcissistic personality disorder due to his troubled childhood, and that she believed that he had told the truth about what had occurred on the 3rd of January, and that he'd been in a disassociated state at the time and couldn't be held responsible for his actions. Her testimony was shocking, 
but it was very soon pulled apart by the state. It emerged that she hadn't looked at any of the other testimony or any transcript of the court proceedings thus far. She'd worked solely off what Johanna told her, accepting it as truth. The woman was also unable to define the requirements for a temporary insanity defence, which should have been something she considered if she was going to testify that the defence had merit. The strangest part of the woman's testimony, though, was that it seemed like Johann Kotzer had gotten under her skin. She described him as kind and gentle and said that she felt sorry for him because he had such difficulty in remembering what had happened. The woman was known for her wild curly hairstyle that she'd worn in the same way for many years and in several trials. When she appeared to testify for Johan though, she had cut her hair. It was also reported shortly afterwards that she was helping Johan to write his life story. The judge heavily chastised the woman for having testified without any facts to back up her testimony, and she quietly agreed that she would do better in future. Forensic psychologist Gerard Labaskachny was asked to weigh in on what he thought about the woman's testimony, and he said, quote, It was out of this world. Luck like maybe from Uranus? End quote. By bringing in the psychologist to testify, the defence opened up the opportunity for the state to present their own psychologist's findings. The state's psychologist had reviewed all of the evidence and interviewed Johann Kotzer for seven hours. He found that there was absolutely no evidence of any personality disorders and that Johann Kotzer knew exactly what he was doing at the time of the crimes. The narrative that had developed originally around the accomplices being forced to take part was really their only hope of a defence, so their lawyers focused on this as heavily as they could. Any person who had made a statement in the early days of the case, which even remotely implied that the men were also victims, was called to testify. This, unfortunately, included Inna's ex-husband, Rex. In the aftermath of the devastating loss of his son, he had made a brief statement to a journalist that, as he understood it, the men were held at gunpoint to rape Inna. When asked why he'd said this, Rex stated that he believed that that was what Inna had told him. This testimony would have a terrible domino effect in the Bonnet family, as Rex's daughter Angelique felt like he was calling her mother a liar and blaming her for what had happened. A rift formed between the two because of this. Rex stated in no uncertain terms, though, that although he felt there were things that Inna could have done to avoid having Johan in their lives, he didn't blame her for what happened. Despite the accomplices' claims that they'd been victims, none of them could explain why they hadn't run away when they had several chances to do so. They also couldn't explain why they could go to police to complain that courts hadn't paid them, but they made no attempt to tell the police what had happened. And finally, if they had only pretended to rape Inna, why had they not called for help for her and her son the minute that they got out of that house? In his sentencing, the judge praised Inna for her strength and capability to testify so clearly to such traumatic events. He said that he completely believed her version of events and found it highly objectionable that blame was being placed on her by Johan and some members of the public. He called Johan Kotzer inherently evil and said that he didn't believe for a minute that he'd been under any emotional distress at the time of his actions. The judge stated that there was sufficient evidence to prove that Johan had meticulously planned the attack for weeks, and that he'd purposefully left Inna with not just physical scars, but also considerable emotional scars, 
so that she would never be able to forget him. As for the accomplices, the judge believed that all three men had in fact raped Ina Bonai, and that they'd done so of their own free will. He believed that Sitole was working with Kotsa, and that he had equal responsibility in all of the events of the 3rd of January 2012. The other two men may not have had as much prior knowledge as Satole did, but they were informed of the reason for attending Johann Kurz's premises that day, and they'd agreed to rape Ina. Johann Kurz and Andre Satole were found guilty of all the charges against them except for the attempted murder of Ina Bonai. This charge rested on the fact that the state believed Satole had prior knowledge of his HIV status, which couldn't be proven. Both men were given two life sentences, as well as an additional 10 years, for the kidnapping charges. Peter Mochlake and Salom Parker were acquitted of the murder of Conrad Brunet, as it was not proven that they had had prior knowledge that he was going to be killed, and they were also acquitted of the attempted murder of Ina Bornai. For the rape, they were both given a life sentence and an additional 10 years for kidnapping. Ina Bonet arrived in the courtroom with a tense expression, her face pale and drawn. As the judge went through his judgments and it became clear that she'd been vindicated, her name had been cleared and her son had received the justice he deserved. She looked as though the world had been lifted off her shoulders. She told reporters afterwards that she'd be going straight to her son's grave to tell him that his murderers would never see the light of day again. The Bonet family may have received closure that day, but it was just the beginning of their journey of grief. Their lives had been completely destroyed, and they had to rebuild themselves as well as their relationships. Despite the judgments, Ina found that some people in the community still believed that she was somehow to blame for what had happened to her. Even those who believed her found it difficult to be around her, and her business suffered because, as she put it, no one wants to buy life insurance from someone who's been gang-raped. She refused to leave Mordimole, though, and bit by bit, she rebuilt a new life on the ruins of her old one. Although so many people still supported Johann Kotza, what I found interesting is that the two people who had been so close to him before, Dirk and Vivian van der Merwe, became some, some of Ina's biggest supporters. They were also the only people besides the police to actually see what Johann had done firsthand. They saw the crime scene, and in my opinion, that made all the difference. Johan was, and still is, so good at manipulating people into believing that he's a wonderful, kind, and honest man, that the only thing that could change many people's minds was actually seeing what he had done in front of them. Dirk van der had cleaned the house of Conrad's blood, He'd found pieces of Conrad's teeth scattered around the hallway. Vivian had seen it all. Conrad's body, inner tied up and gagged, naked and mutilated. And that was what it had taken for them to finally realise that the man who'd played the role of the decent and good friend for decades was nothing but a monster. Ina Bonet works as a motivational speaker today. She tells her story to groups in order to help both women and men understand the dangers of accepting emotional abuse. Ina's advice about getting into relationships is to never allow yourself to be blinded by love. She thinks about the calls that she got from Sarita and Marita and wishes that she had listened. I don't know that anything that Ina could have done after she was already in Johan's clutches would have changed the ultimate outcome, but it's definitely worth heeding the advice 
to be open to new relationships, but always, always be open to the possibility that the smiling, wonderful man or woman standing in front of you is not who they pretend to be. Johann Kotzer was denied leave to appeal. Many of the Facebook pages in his support were shut down, but one remains open. It's a private group run by one of his stepsisters. It's called Fensterki Nabeta, which in English means a window to the outside. It has 15 group members and its last post was more than 30 days ago. As for Johan's accomplices, I believe that Sotole was definitely involved in the planning of the attack on Ina. I do think that he had recruited the two other men, and I think that they were told why they were going to Johan's house that day. I think that they agreed, maybe believing that they were just going to scare Ina, but they were not averse to raping her. When they saw the mutilation, though, I think they probably wanted to back out, but their failure to flee or try and get any help proves their ultimate culpability, in my opinion. Johann Kotzer spent his entire life hurting people. There is more than enough evidence of that. He destroyed many lives, and the domino effect of his actions will continue almost unendingly. Betbuerta's eight children were orphaned when he killed her. The result of those children growing up without a maternal figure is immeasurable. Sarita Fenta lost her life, and, as far as I'm concerned, whether Johan directly killed her or not, he has a huge amount of culpability in her death. Despite her brain tumour, before meeting Johan, she was mentally and emotionally strong. She was financially stable. She was fighting her disease and doing well. Marita and all of the other women that Johan financially and emotionally destroyed will probably never trust again. Ina Bonai will be permanently physically scarred and have to think about Johan every time she looks at herself. Not that she'd ever be able to forget him, considering the fact that he's the reason that her son lost the chance to live. Conrad, at his young age, was already ten times the man and human being that Johann Kotzer could ever dream of being. If he thought that he could destroy Ina Bonet, he was wrong. She may be forever damaged, but she's still standing, and insistent that she will continue to live her life in honour of her son. Thank you for listening to episode 18, The Mori Mori Monster. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the app that you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to help support the show, you can do so through our Patreon page. And we also have a few books on our website which are sold through affiliate links so we earn a commission on that as well. I'll be back next Friday with a mini-sode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.